Cardiff docks and one of the Bristol Queen steamers leaving on a channel cruise to Tenby. The channel has been a vital factor of the trade and the pleasure of South Wales. It has floated out enough coal to keep the civilized world warm for a century. And it has launched countless thousands of holiday outings which have consumed a volume of pop and ale large enough to replace the channel at a pinch. There is nothing quite like the sight of the sea for people whose horizons for months has been corseted by narrow valleys or dirt-bound streets. As the ship pulls out, a million old promises seem to be renewed. Life grows large with a sense of a renewal, of a clean new start. In the sound and movement of seabirds, dreams of liberation sing again. In the eyes of the old, there is a shadow of regret. In the limbs of the young, the surge of adventurous passion. In the minds of some, there will be a queasy unease at the prospect of the new medium of sea travel. The sea is deep, and the masterful throb of the engines a trifle oppressive. In the minds of others, to whom Anis Mardi, Mountain Ash, Abergorky might have become somewhat stale, there may be a wish that the journey will go on forever to the Azores, Panama, or that well-known beach at Waikiki. Indeed, this cruise is going further than most, not to Waikiki, but to a place quite charming, even though it favors less grass in the skirts. We are going to Tenby. Our steamer will travel the whole length of the channel clear down to the Atlantic coast. It will be a long day, a full day. And this is where our journey will end, Tenby in Pembrokeshire, possibly the most lovely and the least Welsh of all the Welsh counties. So many of the Celtic population here are fey, have second sight. They really need to read newspapers. They are really with the future. The color of the sea around Tenby is remarkable. It is purely blue. To people who have lived alongside one of the South Wales rivers, that gave up the ghost of cleanliness about the time of the Crimean War, this can come as quite a shock of delight. As does the fact that Tenby Harbour is in the fullest sense a harbour, a place where men work, follow the ancient crafts brought into being by the demand of the sea to be sailed on and the need for fish to be netted, filleted and fried. These skills have the simplicity and the endurance of seagulls. They have supported men from the beginning of time and will continue to do so until some wizard gets the idea of selling seawater and will use up all the stock. To the south and east of Tenby, men and women lead elaborate, complicated lives in oil refineries, steel mills and coal pits. Yet here, fishermen and the monks who came from Trentoni Abbey in Monmouthshire to settle on the tiny island of Caldy in the bay here, can still labor on in a Stone Age quietness. Coal, oil, steel, by some geographical freak or political error, could all pass away. But the fishermen and the monks could, I suppose, still manage after a fashion. Eric the Red, a diligent and destructive Viking, who acted the goat between here and Norway about a thousand years ago, was in and out of here like a draft, looting, kidnapping, and implanting the tall, blonde characteristics of the Nordic people upon the less evasive natives. Now you need a license. Tenby has a planned grace that is not common in most Welsh towns. The ancient town walls and the five arches give a framework and a core. When Augustus John lived here as a boy at the end of the last century, he reported it as being a town of fashion, whose citizens boasted of their social station and gentility. A sort of miniature bath that had missed the Roman occupation. A vanity fair with the sea instead of saline baths. When Augustus John returned here as a mature man, he claimed that much of the gentility had gone, and he missed the russet sails of the large fishing fleet that had once thronged in the harbor. But the place still looks endlessly gracious to us. 
a nest of ripe charm after the rough and ready housing arrangements of the mining valleys. I wonder what gulls make of steamers. In an average summer day, they must take in, in biscuits alone, the content of an average tuck shop. And are they alarmed still by the pounding of the engines from the heart of the ship? Or do they put it down to the fact that biscuits are naturally noisy objects? The engines gleam and shimmer, thrusting forward as resolute as the will of the passengers to extract as much joy from this day as possible. This steel is tended as reverently as an altar. If we could treat each other as carefully as we treat machines, we'd be doing very well. Tenby waits. The beach is given over to the activities which are strangely and strenuously unlike those we normally pursue. If we could have six months without interruption, given over to the fun and games of beach life, we would either earn the George Cross or the cold shoulder from every insurance company. Some scientists believe that life came from an odd primal communion between the lapping tide and the edge of the earth. Since then, travel agencies and uh, Sunday school outings have been trying to take life back there. It is here that the young and the old show how differently they face after life. It is the place where, most of all, the elderly want to be still, cover the face, show their braces, and deck chairs are as hard to get out of as jail. People play on beaches, people sleep on beaches, because they want to avoid the responsibility of eating on beaches. Those who slumber on Tenby's shore, who are at peace, little know what is in store for them a mere five legal drinking minutes away. The pilgrims thrust forward with a widening wake. A day out is a very special thing. A month out, a year out would allow you to take things calmly, to approach one's pleasures gravely and with solemn moderation. But when the escape period is short, we are under an almost sacred obligation to live it up. This is especially so in Wales, where for many years, on Sundays, pubs were padlocked like prisons and malt had to hide in the hills with a price on its head. First you find your sea legs, then you lose them. That's Welsh luck. So the steamer, with its miraculous suspension of the licensing laws, became a floating paradise. It became a sort of symbol of freedom. We have known enough in our time of austerity, restriction, denial, it's nice to find a place where the shutters are up, and if you want something, you can get it. At some point or another, you simply have to meet the challenge of fresh air. But for the majority, the whole day is a gay, gurgling song. And for others yet, there are the moments of sad defeat. Every outing must have an inning, and now we are coming into Tenby. It's got to go somewhere. A lot of people object to this. Every outing is in part a kind of invasion and defensive measures are taken. We've all seen those pubs with signs outside that say no coaches, no gypsies. I even saw one that said no chairs. The tripper is viewed as a kind of Martian, bringing his own dark mysteries. They hate silence and would appear to be tone deaf. Nothing compares with the excitement of seeming to take over a new town. The transistor takes its place among the plaques of Moses. They fill the world with music, most of it guaranteed to induce migraine or meningitis in a matter of minutes. The visitors have fiercer appetites altogether than the people on whom they descend. They want more sounds, more movement, and especially more food. Most resorts seem geared to the appetite of some sort of imaginary tapeworm. Of most resorts, one could faithfully say, this is the kingdom of the chip, the principality of floss, the empire of pop. Enough starch and sugar to widen the world's waistline overnight. Those bold, brassy postcards that suggest a wilder, warmer, more willing life. And a quiet basin full of the old bingo, when the need for culture becomes irresistible. For a day, the boys are the narrow-trousered princes of the world, strutting up to life and telling it to dance at a faster beat, giving notice to quit to all the things that seem to clog and hinder the smooth flow of excitement and delight. 
But we cannot sustain this weight of yearning and daring for long. The afternoon begins to lose its best light. The revelers head back to the steamer. In the quiet streets, the traditionalists speak up once again for cool restraint, for a stronger lead on the robust and thrusting neck of temptation and sin. The steamer faces east again. Ilfracu, Bari, Cardiff await their midnight deposits of weary pilgrims. The barman will massage their groaning muscles. The children's bodies, with their every movement, will rustle as they disturb the layers of consumed potato crisps. The sea will wonder why human beings are so much less tidy than fish, who simply eat each other and use no cans or bottles. The beach will wonder tolerantly where the players, the lovers, and the sleepers are gone, and when they will return.